All right, this should be going out live now. Let me just check things, make sure things are working. Looks like it's working. Yep, cool. Alright, welcome to Astronomy Live. So tonight I'm going to be doing a live stream here talking about some of the latest data I've got on the Tesla in deep space. The SpaceX Falcon Heavy launched a Tesla into deep space, out of Earth orbit, uh, into an orbit that takes it slightly past Mars's orbit around the Sun. And over the last eight days or so I've been taking pictures of it using a telescope in Australia, which you can see conveniently enough positioned behind Starman in this picture that Elon Musk tweeted of Mission Control an hour and 23 minutes after the launch last week. So we're going to talk about that and we're going to do a simulation of the launch and see if we can fit that to the orbit that the object seems to be in. We'll see if that's consistent with the telescopic images and I'll discuss how I know that it really is the second stage of the Falcon Heavy. All right, so we're going to get into it here, but I do want to say that this first part of the stream, we're going to be talking about the actual pictures and some of the data, and I'm probably going to split this off into a separate video afterwards as its own upload, because I think uh, for people who just want to get the gist of the data and what the numbers show, from the actual telescopic images, uh, this can make a nice, brief, relatively brief summary of that. But we're going to keep streaming after that to do a simulation of the launch, and I'm going to see if I can get it to simulate the whole webcast, uh, the Starman webcast that SpaceX put up for several hours after the launch. When they did that, the second stage was in a parking orbit of sorts, it was in an elliptical orbit that took it as close as about 190 kilometers from Earth's surface up to about 7,000 kilometers from Earth's surface. And after about six hours, they ejected it from Earth orbit using a final burn of the second stage to push it out of Earth orbit all the way out to Mars and even slightly beyond. And so we're gonna get into that now. So this, as I mentioned, is a photo uh, that Elon Musk tweeted out shortly after launch. You can see the mission timer up there at the top. 2045, that's universal time actually for when the launch actually occurred at 8.45 p.m. universal time or uh, 3.45 p.m. Uh, local time, eastern time, uh, where I was viewing the launch. And you can see the timer above that, one hour, 23 minutes, 27 seconds. And so if you do the math, uh, that seems to indicate that the image occurred at 22.07 uh, in 27 seconds universal time. And so we'll see if that matches up with the simulation. And I should probably check on the simulation. So we, it's actually counting down right now. I can pause it if I need to, but uh, we'll get to that in a minute. I've got about 23 minutes till launch on the simulation. So let's get into some of the images. So this is an image I took of the Tesla and second stage in space earlier today using a telescope in Australia, T27 on the itelescope.net network. This is a 0.7 meter telescope. In other words, its aperture is about 28 inches, uh, which is quite significant. Um, it's quite a powerful telescope, uh, just about the most powerful telescope you can rent anywhere. Um, and you can use this telescope, you can specify where you want it to point and what you want it to take pictures of. And what I had to do is I had to take pictures of the Falcon Heavy second stage in deep space. Now, according to my calculations, it was over seven times farther than the moon at the time that this picture was taken uh, earlier today. In fact, it was almost 7.8 times the uh, Earth-Moon distance at that time. And uh, using SAO image DS9, I'm able to pull the coordinates for uh, the object in that image. And I took four images today, so I'm going to go ahead and blink those so you can see them in motion. So there you go. And the times and universal time are listed there as well. Now, using that information, I can solve for the orbit. 
and I did this in an earlier video uh, about eight days ago and I'm able to add the current data from today into that solution and produce a better solution. The first day I tracked the Tesla and the second stage I only had about an hour's worth of data and so that's a very short arc to cover the orbit and so the orbit's going to be fairly uncertain. There's going to be a certain degree of uncertainty in that orbit solution. But as you cover more of the orbit, as you cover more time, the certain uncertainty goes down. You don't need a drastic number of observations as much as you do time. Time is a pre precious commodity when trying to nail down an orbit. The more time you can cover, the better. Which makes it challenging when the object is getting progressively dimmer and dimmer. When I first imaged it about eight days ago, it was within grasp of many amateur telescopes, but now it really does require a very powerful uh, telescope to see it. So this 0.7 meter telescope can see it, but as you can see, it's a very dim little dot. And this has led some people to question, how can I possibly know what that dot really represents? How can I possibly know what that is? In fact, it's so dim, it may be coming across uh, rather poorly on the stream. So let me just pop on a, um, a blown up view here. Let me pause this. Okay, and I'm gonna turn on a slightly expanded and slightly contrast enhanced view here so you can see that now it might be a little more clear but you can still see it's a very faint object and so how can I possibly know what that is well obviously the identification is not taking place based on the shape you can't resolve the shape of it that far away it's, it's much much too far away for any telescope on earth or even Hubble uh, to resolve it as more than a point like light source meaning looking like a star that moves. And that's what we see here, but we can trace the orbit and that tells, can tell us some very important information here. And so I'm going to show you guys what that actually tells us. So this is the orbit solution. This is all of the data I've collected so far. So from February 8th all up to today, including some observations I did on February 13th as well, we have a pretty good orbit solution here from just 20 observations enough to make certain determinations. For example, on the left side, you'll see uh, a box above the white box that shows you the orbit elements relative to the Earth. And you can see perigee occurred on February 7th at about 2.36 universal time, give or take. That means that's when it was last closest to Earth. And that distance, if you look at the little Q, says 6976 and change, that's in kilometers. And so that's from the center of the Earth. In other words, it was less than a thousand kilometers from Earth according to this orbit at about that time. And you can see that the eccentricity E is 1.2 and change. In other words, it's hyperbolic. It's ejected from Earth orbit and it's heading out into deep space. The inclination, uh, 28.6 degrees, that's a very familiar number to me because that is the latitude where I grew up in town uh, just near the Space Center. And that happens to be the latitude of the Space Center and the launch site. And that's not a coincidence. They launched the Falcon Heavy with a heading due east of 90 degrees. And that means the inclination relative to Earth takes on the latitude of the launch site. And so as you can see, if I solve for the orbit, it tells me this thing came from Kennedy Space Center. So, uh, you can also see on the right side, highlighted in blue, a particular point in time and some particular coordinates for MPC code 696, which corresponds to the location of the MMT Observatory. And the reason I've pulled that up is they have this video here from MMT, and they actually caught the second stage doing its final burn, ejecting from Earth orbit uh, on the evening after the launch. And so I'll play this little time lapse here from uh, their all sky camera. So let me come in here. Let's see. Let's make this theater mode so it's a little bit bigger. And I'll go ahead and play this video. And so on the right hand side near the west direction, you can see a large white ball. And that is the second stage. I'm suspecting that they've already done an, a eulage burn there to push the fuel towards the bottom of the fuel tank frequently with uh, vehicles like this. They have to basically induce a little bit of thrust to shove all the fuel to the back of the fuel tank so that 
when they engage the engine, there's fuel in the lines and everything flows properly. And so at that point, you would expect to have a bit of a cloud around the vehicle from that initial thrust. But they haven't actually engaged the engine just yet. You'll see it when it comes on. Uh, it really starts to lengthen out a lot more. Um, and you can see the time up at the top was about 7.30 local time, which was about 9.30 Eastern time uh, where I was at. So here in a second, you'll really start to see it suddenly grow. There it goes. It's starting to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And so that's actually doing the burn there. And right here in a second, right there, it shuts off. And so that was the end of the burn. You can see a little bit of a streak just at the tip of where that large white area is. That large white cloud is the exhaust from them doing the burn that ejected it uh, from Earth orbit. And that was at about uh, 9.32 Eastern time, or about 7.32 local time there at the MMT Observatory in Arizona. So I've actually done a measurement of this, and you can see that here. And basically I just took this image into GIMP and measured out how far that little streak was, right as the engine shut off, from the center of the image, or the zenith, the point highest in the sky, and also the angle. And you can see that there at the bottom, it was 503.3 pixels from zenith. Uh, I also measured before this point um, the distance between a couple of known stars, Rigel and Capella, in order to determine the image scale. And according to my calculations, the image scale is uh, roughly uh, about 8.5 pixels per degree. Now, all sky cameras like this do have a lot of optical distortion, so it's not going to be perfect. But if you do the math, it actually comes out pretty well. Uh, so let me go back to the orbit here in that blue line I've highlighted there. So you can see a couple of numbers of importance here where it says plus on the right, towards the right side, it says plus 27, then a space, then 196. That's the altitude in azimuth that my orbit calculation predicts the object I, de I detected and tracked to be at, at that very time. Uh, at the time that burn was occurring, my orbit predicts that it was about 27 degrees uh, high and at an azimuth of 196, right as the, the burn shut off and uh, where that picture was uh, looking. So let me turn off the orbit again. So again, I measured it using GIMP and using uh, that measurement, it comes out to be about 31 degrees altitude uh, based on the distance from zenith. You can uh, subtract that from 90 uh, to get the altitude of the horizon. And then the azimuth uh, based on the angle there of 770, uh, 77.84 degrees uh, if you subtract that from uh, uh, 270, uh, that tells you what the azimuth angle was, which comes out to 192 degrees, so 12 degrees west of due south. And so that's within about 4 degrees of the predicted angle in both altitude and azimuth. So again, based on the orbit uh, that I calculated, if you trace that back to this moment in time at that observatory, it should have been visible in the sky at right about that position. So that tells me that's the same object, which is no surprise because this is the Falcon Heavy second stage performing its final burn. So again, it all matches up. It came from uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the, the, the time there at Perigee, uh, 2.36 universal time or about 9.36 Eastern time, so within a few minutes of the observed burn time, that's when it was last closest to Earth, and uh, the position matches what was seen by observers on the ground as it left the Earth. So yes, that is the Falcon Heavy second stage, but we're going to do uh, some more work with it here and use a simulator, Orbiter Spaceflight Simulator, to actually simulate the launch. We did this once before, I did this uh, a short uh, time before the launch occurred. But I didn't really know what the flight plan was really going to be at that time. I knew roughly what it was going to do. It was going to uh, put the second stage into an orbit that took it away from Earth and out as far as Mars. But we now know they did a burn to depletion uh, where they basically used all their remaining fuel to throw that thing as hard as they possibly could out into the outer solar system. And it took it uh, to an aphelion point or a point uh, furthest from the sun in its orbit that is just past Mars's orbit. Um, so yeah, that's uh, quite cool. 
Uh, you can also see, well, I guess you can't see it on that screen, but uh, I do have a link I'll put in the video description where you can see the orbit solution done a couple different ways. One giving uh, heliocentric orbital elements as well as the minimum orbit intersect distance, which is quite low relative to Earth, as you would expect, because that's where it came from. And there's been some studies done of the orbit that suggest there's about a 6% chance it's going to come back and hit Earth one day in the next few million years. Nothing to really worry about, but it's kind of interesting that uh, it may not stay up there for uh, billions of years, but maybe just a few million years. So, like I said, we're going to switch now to the simulator and simulate that flight once again, but now we know what the orbit was. We know that uh, the orbit, according to official sources, uh, got within about 190 uh, kilometers at perigee and 7,000 kilometers at apogee, furthest point from Earth, before they did this burn. And so we're going to try to match that orbit and we're then going to try to match the ejection burn and see if we can match it up to the orbit that I've actually calculated from my telescopic observations of the Falcon Heavy second stage. I've imported uh, that data into Orbiter Space Flight Simulator here. And so we're at T minus 11 minutes now and we're gonna go ahead and simulate the launch once more, but this time we're gonna try to fly it uh, with the profile that the vehicle actually flew and we're going to try to match that up and see if it really does match up with the orbital information that I determined. So there are a couple things on the map there. Uh, first of all, let me stop the recording now uh, for sort of the overview of my observations and how we know this really is Falcon uh, Heavy. But uh, if you're just watching the brief summary, you can come back and see the replay of this live stream uh, if you want to see the rest and how uh, the simulation goes.